We are still waiting for people. Please, escorts, ushers, please help us bring people in. We need to start immediately. All right. Because of time and um, we understand that there are a whole lot to be learned today and especially from the wealth of experience of our seasoned speakers. We will just be calling up a few of the speakers now. Uh, we will not unfortunately be able to break into different sessions, but we will be having some of our speakers and people share uh, their goodwill messages uh, with us as we proceed uh, this afternoon. I'll have a couple of them upstage and I'll just have some of them come give their goodwill message on behalf of the associations they represent. So before I call uh, the speakers, I will just call in, I'll be calling a few people to come share their goodwill message. In our midst, we have the Eastbourne president, Mr. Kayser. Sir, please come and share your goodwill message with us on behalf of Institute of Safety Professionals of Nigeria. Please give him a round of applause as he walks to the stage. The IOS president, distinguished safety professionals here in this hall, government officials here present, I, Mr. A.B. Kaiser, representing the Institute of Safety Professionals of Nigeria, a corporate entity enacted by law to practice safety management in the country. IOSH, as before the act was enacted, has a partnership agreement with the former name, Nigerian Institute of Safety Professionals. And since the act was promulgated, we've now revisited that act. I will use this opportunity to implore the IOSH president that we should find time to re look into that MOU for that partnership and collaboration. The Institute of Safety Professionals, which IOSH all its best by propagating to the look and cranny of West Africa, Africa, the world as a whole. It is not easy to propagate safety. Like I do tell Ayosh, each time they called, come to my facility for meetings, I always mention to them, you don't need to discriminate anybody. You have 200 million people to propagate safety to. Safety is your responsibility. Safety is my responsibility. Your safety is my safety. And we rounded up. We have a slogan. And what is the slogan? Safety is the orb of all professions. Is there anybody that will say no to it? Safety is the hub of all professions. So on that note, I want to wish uh, Ayosh West Africa all the best to ensure they continue in that light. They maintain the pace. Engagement, collaboration is a continuous effort and we'll continue to do it till we get to at least one-tenth of the population in Africa. Thank you, gentlemen. God bless you. Thank you very, very much, sir. 
thank you for the good will. While we're still expecting people back from lunch, uh, we'll be calling on goodwill message from uh, the representative from University of Port Harcourt, uh, sir. You're welcome, sir. A round of applause for him, please. Um, the president of IOSH and uh, the other organizers of this very great meeting and uh, co-professionals, I wish to recognize your presence. I'm Dr. John Ugbebo. I'm the director for Center for Occupational Health, Safety and Environment, University of Port Harcourt. And also, I wish to really bring the university greeting to you. But before I do that, I'm giving two minutes. I just want to tell you what the center is doing. The Center for Occupational Health and Safety is actually the first of its kind in Nigeria. And uh, we have a mission to meet the need of the industry and uh, society at large in the area of occupational health, safety, and environment through commitment to excellence, training, applied research, continuing education, and capacity building, human capacity building in safety. And our vision is to become the foremost institutional center of excellence in occupational health, safety, and environment. We are doing that. We have graduated a lot of master's degree holders, We've also graduated a lot of PhD students, PhD graduates from here. Some of them are here. And uh, we are very proud to say that we've collaborated with so many organizations in Canada, in US, in Nigeria, and uh, with uh, also ESPON. Um, what we do, we run three sets of program the PGD program in occupational health and safety, and we also do two streams of program at master's and PhD. And uh, we run occupational health and safety and environmental technology and safety, two streams. Our program is accredited by NUC in Nigeria. We had twice accreditation. And uh, we bring in industry lecturers, 40% of those who lectures in the center are from the industry. So university is only having 60% of uh, the lecturers. And our delivery format is modular. Modular, we run a program and have exams every week. And so you graduate your master's uh, program within one year. In fact, we do six months intensive coursework and six months for IT and your project for masters. For PhD, we graduate you within uh, two years, but you may spill over to three years. That's the highest. We are not affected by the university strike. Our program is uh, very intensive. And we have online studies. You are free to do online, you are free to do uh, the physical is your choice. At the comfort of your office, you can. And we have part-time programs. So it meets those three sets of program. I wish to say that uh, we are already discussing a top-level collaboration with uh, IOSH and, uh, so that our students will be able to benefit and the entire university will benefit. We are already opening up a program for first degree, because r right now in all the universities in Nigeria, we don't have first degree in safety. We have up to 140 something university, 148 precisely, both private and public universities. We don't have any of them that is doing safety. We only have uh, safety at HND level. And so we want to introduce that. Last year I was in Ghana in UMT, UMAT, that's the University 
of Mines and Technology Ghana in Tokwa. And uh, we've understood their program and uh, co opt oil and gas and other uh, areas of uh, occupational health and safety. So we may start that any moment from now. So uh, because of time, want of time, I wish to thank you for this great conference. It's a great privilege to be here, and I'm happy for the success of this very program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate you, and we appreciate what the university is doing in propagating safety. So we'll be having uh, a few of our speakers. Let me first of all, on behalf of uh, the committee, apologize to those who will not be able to call uh, to share uh, their presentations with us at this moment. We also want to respect time, safety professionals. We are also very mindful of time. And so we'll just be calling a few uh, speakers to just share uh, the ideas with us and few things that they've put together uh, for this session. So uh, welcome with me, Dr. David Aku. Florence Asibi Ayane. Please pardon me if I mother the name. I apologize. I'm sure I'll soon get a Ghanaian nationality very soon. Engineer Kayode Fuwode. <laughs> Mr. John Montford. Ernest Alazi. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll be asking, let me start with Engineer Kyle De Uh I'm sure the journey of Irish in West Africa can't be complete without the mention of your huge contributions. So uh, can you drive down to how it all started, how the vision started, and um, where we are presently uh, with IOSH, and where IOSH West Africa, and where we need to be, as well as probably sharing your goodwill message. Three minutes, please. <laughs> because I know he's a man of many words. <laughs> We've had to tell a story and also do a good way message together in three minutes, but I'll try. Um, I think I just started uh, the informal network group in 2015. I remember writing Ayosh then and telling them we we'll want to um, Ayosh to be to be in Nigeria, and they said, um, "Well, they're still thinking about it." So we had several um, discussion, and at some point in 2015, we we're given the go ahead to start up an informal branch. So we started with just about I think the first meeting we had about 20 something. At some point, it dropped to 15 to 10. At some point, we had only three people attending the meeting. But what was consistent was we ensured that we were consistent. We never gave up, and we kept trying and trying. Then as of 2018, um, IOS gave us the nod that they want to support us. Um, gradually, we became, an, uh, they actually started supporting our program. Then we became a West Africa division at some point. But uh, what changed everything, like I would say, is consistency. And the great work the network has done, um, the executive, I must give kudos to the present um, chair of West Africa. Of course, Dr. Pomolade was there, Cynthia Ozobu, Temitokwe Mudele, and every others who supported, uh, who came together to make sure that that worked. So generally, I would say for any network group across the globe, consistency is key. You have your ups and downs. There will be time that you have members coming, they will drop. And I'll just say that um, consistency is the backbone of success. Then to my goodwill message, I want to take this. This is a charge to all professionals present. There's a lot of work to do in Africa. And this year I said it, we want an highest president from this region. And it's possible. And I think we can if we continue to drive collaboration with the industry, 
Uh, we need to work more with stakeholders. We need to improve capacity. And generally, as us professionals, we need to volunteer more, be more visible with HIOSH. And please, let's put all hands together. Let's work collaboratively to ensure that we support IOSH and the vision is shared going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you were very timely. It's OK. That's good. Uh, OK, so moving on, I'll be speaking to Dr. David Aku. And now, owing to your world of experience in occupational health and safety, uh, what can you say over the years has been uh, the major challenge that we face as OSH professionals, and also just, you can also just pick few things from your already prepared presentation. Three minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll be brief. Um, so the challenge has been with the focus of occupational health and safety on safety. ILO and WHO did a study over 16 years. They looked at 194 countries. They looked at 19 occupational health and safety risk factors. And they found that 80% of health and safety deaths come from health, from diseases not accidents. Accidents are 20%. So the focus has been safety, accidents, slips, trips, excavations, etc. But things are killing people every year. WHO and ILO found out that 55 hours a week was the cutoff number to develop, to have an increased risk of having heart attacks, to having strokes. 55 hours is 11 hours a day for five days, or eight hours a day for seven days. I'm sure most of us work more than that. We are at risk. We are dying. And the focus has been shifted to safety. But the wind of change is coming. IOSH is leading that wind of change, and we are going to focus on health. So that is my message. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I almost missed out a powerful woman, uh, but I would call her. Is one of the notable women driving occupational health and safety across West Africa. Please give a resounding round of applause to Mrs. Monica Nwosu. Please come and share. Yes, please come. Please keep clapping for her till she gets here. I know you've been at the forefront of driving uh, active participation and women's involvement in occupational health and safety across West Africa. So uh, what can you say basically to uh, the involvement of women so far and what's the women's plan and vision for OHS? Uh, I know something happened be previously where somebody said, oh, I think it was Frank that said we should clap for the women in safety. They forgot to clap for the men. We need to be balancing these things. So, uh -huh. uh, so over to you. All right, thank you. Um, okay, I was thinking that I was going to speak to my um, presentation, but when you mention women, I wake up. Okay, I was already discussing with some women that made presentation. Oh, pardon me, I'm standing on existing protocol, right? Okay. Um, we already know that occupational health and safety industry is male dominated and then of course the women are coming up and one of the major challenge that we have is that stereotype you know that stereotype needs to be broken i had had experiences that um uh, I, I lost opportunities in my early career starting up as occupational health and safety because of my gender and it is real it's a stereotype we need to break. And so one of the things we are advocating for is one of the associations we have created, Association of Nigerian Women Safety Professionals. And one of the objective or focus that we have is to create a platform where women come to support women. And you know, the older generation, we are holding the younger generation and you know, helping them to break 
the glass ceiling. There's no ceiling really. You are the one that we are the one that is creating the ceiling. And when women come to the table, we're not coming to the table because somebody is pitting our agenda. We are coming to the table because we are competent to do the job. We are coming to the table because we have something to bring to the table, and we are coming to the table because we want to make a change. So uh, yeah, occupational health and safety industry predominantly dominated by male, but then again, the female counterpart, we are making waves. And one of the ways that we can actually make waves is for us to begin to have some specific consideration regarding policies, policies that are related to us specifically when it comes to the issues of family, when it comes to issues of work balance. Of course, when you have, I have, um, experience I was just I was talking with someone this morning and you know I had a baby and the question that was posed to me is you have a baby that is less than one year where are you going to keep your baby and I asked the same question to say that Mr. and Mrs. Who wants to have a baby <laughs> but when you when uh, one goes for interview it's only one that is asked how the baby is going to be catered for i feel that this should be balanced um through policies and i also feel that when it comes to you know um risk assessments specific issues related to um workwares and everything um consideration should be made to the women okay and then just one more minute let me just quickly speak to the paper i wanted to speak to today and it is regarding the informal sector yes we said that um i osh has become a fundamental human right and that implication is it's applicable to all workers you will agree with me right and for all of the presentation we have made today I don't think anybody has spoken to the informal economy. And from the statistics we have, over um, 70 to 80 percent of workers, in, particularly in West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, are, domin are dominant in the informal sector. They are self-employed, they are self-owned businesses. Now, when you are saying that OSHA has become a fundamental human right. How do we speak to this sector? I had so one or two recommendations I have made. I'll just list out one or two and then I'll just hand over um, the microphone for my presentation. Uh, one of the things that I was going to you know, outline as a recommendation is the fact that we need to look at the curriculum of the, um, of the informal sector. Um, for the SOMI, the mechanic workshops, for the, um, for the um, tailoring workshop, a lot of them. There's nothing regarding occupational health and safety. I know that Institute of Safety Professionals of Nigeria, they are doing some, sorry, I'm very fast. They are doing something with the MBT, that is the um, National Board for Edu Training and Education, trying to inculcate occupational health and safety into the curriculum of artisans which is very, very important. They have very well structured curriculum for technical aspects of their work, but nothing regarding occupational health and safety. And I think it's very important that we begin to look in that direction if we must include and make this inclusive. If really, truly, or she's going to become a fundamental labor right or human right at work, we, mean, we must, as a matter of urgency, begin to look at collaboration especially regarding the informal sector. They have trade union, very organized trade unions, very organized um, sectors. I was privileged to speak with one or two of them, and you know, we did one or two statistics regarding them. And the results we got was really very discouraging. And the reason why they would want to do any form of, any for put in place any form of health and safety structure is because inspectors are coming. And the truth is that these inspectors, they don't even come regularly. They come once in a blue moon, and when they come, their focus is not on the occupational health and safety. Guess what? Their focus is just on the remittances that they need to, their annual um, remittances as a trade. That is the focus of this, um, of this group. So we need to also look at national policies that will specifically speak to them. Because really, there's no way you can make us a fundamental human right without having a, a, an effective management system. And think of management system. It has to be owned by them such that we need to do, you know, create more advocacy and awareness. So. The question I'm leaving with us as I go to take my seat is Ayosh Ispon Asse, um, Ghana Institution of Occupational Health and Safety, and all of us, um, um, all of us health safety professionals, trade unions, uh, uh, NGOs, social um, development entrepreneurs, 
we need to create that platform. We need to come together. We need to collaborate. We need to go reach out to them such that our national policies that we are advocating for is also having a space specifically for the informal sector. They make up at least 34 to 35 percent of our GDP is coming from them. Thank you. Ma, we need to balance something. When you said uh, the women should get involved, I, I hope you're also helping us advocate that when women appear at places uh, of work, they should appear rightly. Uh, because I've been on the construction site and you have a woman walking, she's coming to talk about health and safety and she's wearing a skirt. I don't know how we're going to drive that and what exactly you'll be enforcing. So please help us balance it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, as we move on, uh, I was speaking to Ernest. Uh, I'm sure you're saddled with the responsibility uh, as well as the other committee members within your team pushing IOSH. Uh, agenda in Ghana specifically and so I want to ask you and we had the chairman speaking about a member bringing another member another member bringing another member this is speaking to driving membership so what's the plan to drive membership I'm sure we have a whole lot of people here who are at this conference today who are not members of IOSH how are we who are also from Ghana here how are we going to get them on board, as well as also you share your experience on OHS uh, work-related. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure being here today. And uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for making it up here. It's not been easy spending the entire day here. Yes, uh, driving membership is key when we want to increase. We started with zero number. I remember when we went to Nigeria, we came back. Afterwards, working with a contractor as an, a health and safety professional wasn't easy. Um, I've had all the challenges that you can think of um, as a lady in the midst of men. Um, in the race, you're in the Wellington boot, in the pit. Um, you are going for water sample monitoring in your boot, and you are the only lady who happened to be with them. Um, he rightly stated that in the construction industry where ladies wear skirts, it's so difficult. Yes, um, sometimes we just want to wear a skirt. But this is an industry where, you know, due to the exposure and what you have to do, you cannot wear certain dresses. So you get all kind of names. They call it lady man, man lady, all kind of funny terms. You don't even just know what to do. If you don't have the strength, I almost pulled out. But if you don't have the strength and you don't focus and you don't know what you are driving at, you would definitely pull out. How did I manage out? I saw that it's a male-dominated industry. I have a lot of people who coached me, the likes like Ransford was also in the same mice. A lot of them who coached me, who gave me the encouragement, who pushed me. And I saw that to compete with men, the best thing is to get the qualifications first. So I started with all the qualifications I needed to do. I just needed to prove a point that we can equally do it. So I, 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 I just started. There was no year I wouldn't add an impact in my life with an additional qualification. Then I haven't heard of it. But then I was doing the right courses, not just any course. So I finished and I said, okay, I need to chatter. I checked around. In Ghana, no lady was chatted. I said, okay, how, if I, how about if I make this record straight? I started the process, and in less than six months, I got chatted. Um, I had people who were in the process for two years, and I was like, okay, how did I do it? Then I became a voice. I, I, I had a lot of ladies call me. How did you do it? Uh, you start along the line, and then they give up. So it's, it's a spirit of not giving up. It's about the passion you have or you want to do what is expected of you. And I, just not to talk too much, it is a prof profession I do with passion and I go all out. So whatever is required of me, I try to do it. 
and do it right. And I know anyone sitting here, everyone sitting here, becoming a member of IOSH has added, has been a good advantage to me because I got to understand other dynamics of safety with their newsletters, um, weekly um, emails, and everything happening across the globe. And that has really been impactful. And I, I must say, um, if you are not an IOSH member, you would like to be part because the benefit is actually great. Thank you. Please, you can increase that for her. Thank you. Uh, you spoke to something that is pertinent to Africa, and I'm sure Engineer Sazitu, when he was speaking, he was speaking about it's a profession where most people, when they don't get jobs, they just double into. I don't know if that happens in Ghana, but I know that happens a lot in Nigeria. So we have uh, people who study biology who are haven't looked for a job in a uh, proper laboratory and couldn't get, and you just get called up. Uh, there's a construction site. You need to come sign up as a safety officer, and that's how you start, and then you start to grow career. Now, I'm going to be speaking to uh, Mr. John, because now, how... Okay, sorry, don't let me, yes, Mr. John Montford, yes. That name sounds like somebody from Canada. <laughs> However, yeah, I'm going to be speaking uh, to you. How can we make OHS very attractive? Because it is something attractive that people run to. Yeah, so how can we make OHS attractive rather than uh, the least of the jobs to be opted for? And then you can share a few things from your knowledge and experience. Thank you. Good evening to you all and all protocols observed. Making OHS um, attractive is about what we call the principle of mutual benefits. So the question is, what, what's in for you? What's in for me? If what you do can affect me negatively, that means I can be impacted. If what I do can affect you negatively, can, then that means like you can also be negatively impacted. Now, if I'm able to encourage you or to win you that if you work safely or do the right things, we will not encounter um, incidents and we are, we, we're going to use health, health and safety as an enabler. And we are going to have more profitability, you know, um, you go home safely, etc. Et your, your job is guaranteed. Then that's mutual benefits. So for me, it's about mutual benefits, the principle of mutual benefits. You're able to do that, you win people. But if they don't know what's in for them, it will be as if you are just, uh, just deploying or just telling them, do this, do that, without knowing the benefits. They will not do it with understanding. Thank you. So I want to continue with uh, okay, yes. my presentation. Yeah. Okay. Two minutes. All right. So my, my topic was on learning from actual and potential process safety events. So what do you mean by actual? Incidents that you have recorded in your organization. Potential is relevant incidents that have occurred elsewhere but applicable to your organization. Now, what is process safety or where is process safety applicable? It's applicable in the oil and gas industry, the explosives industry, the um, pharmaceutical factories, etc. Now, process safety management is about the prevention and mitigation of loss of containment of energy and hazardous substances that could result in process safety near misses, structural collapses, damage to the environment, fires, explosions, etc. Now, why should we give process safety attention? Process safety incidents could result in many loss of lives, as I've said, Unlike personal safety, with personal safety, it's just about the individual slip, strips, and falls. But with process safety, it's difficult to predict because sometimes you may have to do, you have to inspect the so there's a safety critical devices, you have to test them for functionality, test them for availability, test them for reliability, test them for survivability, interdependency. I'm just summarizing it. Now, in, in process safety incident, just one incident, let's say BP Texas 2005, just one incident, 15 people died. 
about 180 people got injured. What, were the, what went wrong? Inherently safer design concepts. They didn't practice it. There were people in a trailer, uh, sorry, a containerized um, office right at the heart of the plant. They didn't practice it. Now you look at Fleece Barrow, 1974, what went wrong? The same inherently safer design concept was also not practiced. 28 people died. Um, about 1,800 buildings outside, outside the, um, the company got damaged. Now, process safety incidents affect people most of the time on site and off site. Whilst when you're talking about personal safety, it's normally people just at the workplace. Now, what must we do? Let's learn from incidents to avoid what we call corporate amnesia. What is corporate amnesia? Corporate amnesia is, is about the situation whereby the organization fails to learn. They fail to learn from what, is, what they must do by working to the required standards. Now, certain people may be competent. When they leave the organization, that means that mistakes begin to occur. When they may leave because of maybe retirements, resignations, Etc. Etc. Now, if you don't have competent people in the organization, then you have corporate amnesia. It's an example in the Fleece Barrow incident. The reports said that there was no competent engineer on site who could solve engineering problems. The, the competent personnel had resigned, and they could not replace him with somebody who was equally competent. So, management of change of personnel was not done, and it was one of the failures. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, sir. I'm sure you were able to put a whole lot uh, together. Uh, I'll be calling on Hannah Agabe Mensah. Uh, she will be speaking to the role of communication. How do we, what is the OHS language that we should speak? A lot of people have spoken to, oh, we need to carry on the message. We need to push this agenda. Uh, the right to work, the, the right to refuse uh, uh, work, and all of that. So we'll be speaking to communication, and even uh, uh, the ISO 45001 2018 also clearly spoke about communication. So how do, what is the language of communication that OHS professionals should have, and how well should that be deployed? Welcome, ma'am. Round of applause for her, please. Thank you very much. And so before I come to what has been asked, I represent safety in healthcare. I work in Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Most of my mates that we studied safety will not come to the healthcare industry because there is no money. Um, the problem is that we healthcare practitioners have a very tough guy mentality, thinking that we are very much in charge of our health. It is not true. When COVID came, you saw the number of healthcare workers who suffered the infection, who lost their lives due to the infection in taking care of others. And so it is very paramount that we look at the health of health workers, and I'm very happy that Dr. Authority spoke about that. But another thing I channel apart from occupational health and safety is the employee assistant program. And I'm so happy that we are talking about mental health because most of the time, we think that the workplace is a very sterile environment, and so we need to lock our emotions, all our problems at the door once we enter. But we know that it doesn't work like that. And yes, accidents are happening because we are not mentally present. And Edward talked about presenteeism and absenteeism and all that happening. And really, when we want to go down and go depth into the depth of it too, understand the occupational and safety challenges, I think that the focus is right for us to look at the mental health of employees. So thank you very much. But again, to try to answer the question of communication, I think it had already been said that we need to communicate right. I mean, if I met market women and I am talking to them about safety, they don't need to listen to management systems. 
What do they need that for? And so we need to really come down to the level of the people we are advocating and creating the awareness for, so that they understand, even if we need to come down to using their local languages to speak to them or get people who understand the languages that they understand best to really communicate, and communication we know is two-way. And so when we are giving the information, we are not only giving information, but really getting the opportunity to listen to them. In fact, if, you, if I came to your workplace and I wanted to understand the hazards, the risks that you are exposed to, it would be right to listen to you who does the work. As you perform your duties, as you work in the work environment, what are some of the hazards that you are exposed to? What have you experienced before that you think must be addressed? And so when we go out as safety professionals to talk, to advocate, to create awareness, definitely this is very important that we are not scholars only coming to give out information to, but we should also create that two-way, the pathway to listen. And before I leave, we spoke about data, and there is no data even in the healthcare. And so we are launching a program, the Tell Your Story Project. And what we want to do is to listen to health workers who have gone through occupational accidents or diseases. What were the supports that they got? Did they get anything at all? And where are they in their recovery and all that? And I think when we do this, we'll be able to get the baselines right. I mean, I had a lot that I wanted to discuss in favor of healthcare workers, but I see a lot of healthcare workers. But indeed, the last thing I want to say is that when we are thinking health and safety, as occupational health and safety professionals, let us also consider going into the um, hospitals, the healthcare facilities, because there are a lot of issues there. It's not only in the mines, it's not only in the oil and gas industries. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ma. You've helped us strike a balance. So, yeah, uh, we should be communicating uh, well. However, I would also say uh, whatever we are communicating, we should actually lead uh, and actually show examples. What am I saying? You find OHS professionals telling people what to do and they themselves are not doing it. How do you expect people to follow uh, uh, you? One of the greatest uh, challenge I have uh, in preaching health and safety is the fact that I have a wife that challenges me at home. So for every time you do anything to you tell you, I'll go and tell your people. <laughs> I'll go and tell your people, you know? So uh, that became so before I do anything, oh, you want to position the gas cylinder at home, you know where to position because you come back and tell you, health and safety officer. <laughs> and so, yeah, please, it's also a language we all need. And that's leadership, speaking to leadership. You don't force people to, you show people what to do. And I think that's very, very good. Please, a round of applause for all our, our speakers. <laughs> before I let them go, there is a man who has promised to arrest me here. Uh, if I don't call him to share just his goodwill message. Uh, that's, uh, I think, the director from uh, the Department of Factories. Sir, please, one minute. <laughs> one minute. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm standing on the existing protocols. I'm George Garshon, and I'm an electrical chemist from the University of Cape Coast, Ghana. I do health and safety for 22 years, starting from 2001, gone through all the regional set director, and I'm three months old in the factory inspectorate department. There is a problem of factory. When you say factory, it means that any woman or woman we employ for, again, one than, one, more than one person is a factory. That's the definition. So it means we go to construction sectors, all sectors, but we don't go to the mining sector in Ghana. So if accident happens in the mining sector, it's not for the factory inspectorate. We regulate, we have engineering surveys who regulate the cranes, the forklifts, all the machinery, because safety is not only human beings. Machines can injure an uh, employee. So we have engineers of where we regulate. Ghana State Authority, MPA, some I'll be discussing with them the legal regime in regulating that. Because if an accident happens, it's not the duty of NPA, it's not the duty of Ghana State Authority, it's only the duty of factory inspectory. So we ourselves have to stand up, make sure that we do the regulation where by the scarcity in Ghana, 
then the resources are limited. So we have to look at risk assessment to solve high risk problems, not all problems. Scale of preference in economics, opportunity cost, foregone alternative. But in safety, if you are doing safety and you are using the limited resources to solve problems that are not high risk, you are wasting the resources. Governor resources is shared between NPA, factory inspectorate, fire service, we, our taxation is being duplicated. So we need to come together, amalgate, make sure that the OSH bill is passed to reduce government wasting resources in only OSH and doing it in duplication. If you measure noise, you say 85 decibel, which standard are you using? Outside standard, factory inspector standard, mining standard, we need to um, again, we need to not to duplicate health and safety because of limited resources. So I'm talking to my ministry, we make sure this law is passed, but we must read the acts and make sure that we do the rightful thing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, in OHS, we understand balance, and why we have to bring it up is also to balance the side uh, of uh, the factories, and also because we are speaking to the media, and this is going all over the world, because we need to project what uh, we are doing in championing the cause of occupational health and safety. But you said something, and I want to just pick you on that, that you've practiced health and safety for 22 years. However, I would expect, it's, even if it's not within your jurisdiction, you are supposed to influence. So please carry on uh, that as a safety champion, as a safety ambassador, irrespective, even if it's not within, uh, you could have a family member somewhere there. You could have somebody related to you somewhere there. And the policies that you're, 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 you're partnering with could actually save a family member unknowingly. So uh, on this note, I want to say a very big thank you to all that have spoken. Please give them a round of applause as they move to their seats. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been an enriching session uh, with you. Finally, to close us up uh, at this beautiful Irish West African 2023 conference, uh, before I bring my president up, I want with a uh, raise of hand, if you know that you've had an awesome time here, can I see your hands up? I'm sure some people are not raising their hand. Did you, you enjoy the food now? Put your hands off now. <laughs> uh, you enjoy the food now. Even, uh? All right, without wasting much time, I'll bring my Yosh president up, please, with a resounding. I didn't just